Hello there, I'm Black Bright. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on where you're listening in from. Um, if it's the first time you're passing through, welcome to my channel. And if you've been here before and you've already subscribed, enough respect. Um, well, we're approaching, what, Black History Month next month, so I've been hearing a lot about the reparations. We know that the reparations have been happening, um, you know, there have been talks about them for the last 20 odd years and nothing is happening. And so we have to ask ourselves a lot of questions. I mean, there's lots of legal entanglements involved as well as how they are going to do it or is it possible to do it and a lot of stuff. So um, you could say, you know, sometimes, I, well, let me put it this way. If you asked me this question maybe about 10, 15 years ago, I would have said, well, how can you get reparations um, for people who are dead, people who have gone, you're not directly an, an inheritance or heir of the person who's died. You didn't know the ancestor who was enslaved and stuff like that. But then, you know, as you as you evolve, you get more information. You become more knowledgeable, less ignorant, if that's the right word. And you realise that it's not even about um, the, the physical enslavement. It is about that, but it's about the legacy of that enslavement and what it's done and what it's done to people today it's fine saying it happened so far back but how is that impacting on people today how would people how would black people be viewed if they had not been enslaved if they had not been taken against their will and forced to work in horrendous conditions what would they what would our ancestors have been doing now well, what would the what would the um, generations of our ancestors be doing now? How would we be viewed? Would we still be viewed as a second class citizen if we hadn't had that legacy? So when you're thinking about reparations, it's not just about enslavement and what happened years ago. It's about that legacy. It's about that stereotype. It's about the false education. It's about everything that is as a result of that period in our ancestors' lives. And to say it's now remote and distant is a fallacy. You know, legal people, they can switch and they can turn it around all they like. But the way that many black people are treated today is as a direct result of enslavement. Do you think that if we weren't enslaved, we would have um, legislation designed to disadvantage us? If we were all equal, if white and black people were treated equally, do you think we would have racial profiling? Do you think we would have police brutality? Do you think we would have had the hostile environment policy? Do you think we'd have people um, whose applications are being denied or deferred if, there, if we didn't carry that legacy of slavery with us today? So yeah, we are entitled to reparations. I'm not 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 necessarily financial reparations, although that would be nice. But you know, they gave the Japanese, um, the American Japanese, twenty thousand per person for their internment in the U.S. But they only gave the um, who were the not the Filipino Japanese. But they had another, they had Puerto Rican Japanese, they only gave them 5,000 each. So they were discriminating on the American um, Japanese and the Puerto Rican Japanese. But regardless of that, they were, um, they did receive reparations for the trauma that their ancestors in, endured. And so did the, you know, certain people in the Holocaust, but they're saying, that they got reparations because they applied within the 
the standing, the time limit then. The st what they call a statute of limitations, they did it within that time. But they're saying now, black people, we've waited so long, we're so far removed, um, they don't even know how to, um, how to quantify it, to, to repair. But the, what they don't understand is reparation is easy. It doesn't have to be about money. It's about putting us, it's about restitution, really. It's about putting us in a place where we would have been had we not been enslaved. And that means, you know, we would not have been victimized to start off with. That's the biggest thing. We wouldn't have been dragged away and treated like second class citizens and like animals. And people would view us differently if they hadn't told lies about our history. Because that's the biggest thing. You know, we have people who are going to school and they do not know the truth about black history. They haven't got a clue because even like when I went to school, it was like black people didn't exist. Seriously, I don't think in my history lesson I ever came across a black person in history. Maybe Othello, I'm not quite sure because I don't think I did um, Othello in my A-levels in English. I can't even, I did Shakespeare. So not even Othello. So we had no black references at all. And it's not until maybe the last maybe five to ten years, we've got black people on our TV screens doing adverts. Believe me, they, we didn't ha even have black people on our TV screens doing adverts. They're putting them on now because they know we, we spend money and they want to target us. But before that, you wouldn't see black people on our TV screens. So that legacy is not only for black people to think we didn't exist, but it's also telling white people that we didn't exist. And when you keep perpetuating every single black history month about slavery, that's all white people think we were, slaves. It's like when they perpetuate Africa with children with flies coming out of their mouth and their, their, their little mouths drooling and they're all emaciated. That is, they're indoctrinating people, mind conditioning them to, think, to let them feel white people and black people who haven't traveled, that that is what Africa represents. And it's the same way as black people. We're represented as slaves. And that is why reparations are needed and restitution to change the lies, to revert back to the truth, to have a, a transparent education for young people and adults, to say to the world, look, we lied about the history. Black people were the rulers at one time. Black people were the creators of all of these inventions. Yeah, there were white people who created and white people who ruled in certain parts, but give credit where credit's due. You don't suppress it and make it look like we were always slaves because that has connotations and it also impacts on how the police treat black people. And also they had something called black codes and they had the black codes after emancipation. And why they had the back codes was to still enslave, but in a different way. So they enslaved via imprisonment. So what are they doing today? Where are, all our, where are the majority of our black men? Aren't they imprisoned? If they're not imprisoned, they're in detention, you know, waiting for deportation or they're in mental institutions. They're not free. They're not free to roam. Yes, we've got black men that are free to roam. Of course we have. But there is still that perpetuation of black men in a certain class where they're relegated to and how they try to criminalise them. And once you criminalise them and once you throw them in jail, they can't vote. Not that they'd probably vote anyway, but they don't, can't vote. Very difficult to have a job. So you're taking away their economic structure. You're taking away their ability to provide for a family. When they come out, you, you're kind of forcing them to go back into crime because they can't survive. So, you know, so we need to have this addressed. So after my little rant, as I normally do, I go to my notes. 
Ah, so, are black Brits entitled to reparation for their, um, for their enslaved ancestors? Um, Black History Month is next month, so talks about reparations will be more active. We know slavery is a crime against humanity. International law protects the state against retrospective applications, but there are exceptions. In order to file a legal claim for reparations, it must be established that the acts in question were contrary to international law at the time they were committed. While slavery became illegal under international law, it still exists today under the guise of imprisonment, which to me is an argument for reparations. Reparations, in the term I'm about to mention, are not materially impossible. In other words, they're trying to say that reparations are materially impossible, so therefore we can't do anything about it. But they're not, for the reasons I'm about to cite. Um, for reparations to take effect, the law requires the victims to have suffered from a wrong committed by a responsible party with sufficient legal rules to permit such a wrong to give rise to a legal cause. So what about this scenario? Okay, the factual causation, which, sorry, the causation, the factual causation, um, the responsible person would be the state, well, the UK, the victims would be the perp would be black people. The wrongdoing, both then and now, is one manipulating, contriving, and revising legislation so that it disadvantages black people specifically, or foreign nationals, using systems like facial recognition that they know are defective and disadvantage black people specifically. Um, executing the hostile, compliant environment policy that caused black people to lose homes, jobs, be detained, imprisoned, deported, rob them of benefits and health care that they were legally entitled to. Authorising the Section 60 and Operation Nexus, which supports racial profiling and statistics show that blacks are stopped more than whites. Detaining blacks in detention centres without due process. Criminalising black people for minor offences to keep them enslaved and unable to vote. Difficulty getting jobs when they are released, the resultant, the resultant stigma and mental health problems. Illegal, deport, illegal deportation of members of the Windrush generation based um, due to lack of knowledge discrimination and bias. What I mean by that is that those people who were picking them up and sticking them in, de in detention centres hadn't even heard of the Windrush, didn't even know that the Commonwealth citizens were exempt and didn't fall under the hostile environment policy, but yet they experienced that de that denial of benefits and no access to health care and all of that kind of stuff, off their homes or their jobs. So that's what I mean by lack of knowledge. If they knew their history and if they were educated, but what they do, I hear, is that they have little school leavers in the home office. And school leavers, what are they going to know about history? What are they going to know about who's legally entitled to be in the country? They just see a date or a name or a country, they flag it, and then that goes off to Operation Nexus. Nexus goes off, or whoever goes off and pulls these people in. And these poor people didn't have documentation because they're of a certain age where they didn't feel as though they needed it because they were technically citizens. So you've got all of that. And they're talking about we're not entitled to reparations. When this is the direct result of being enslaved, this mentality that some people have against black people and the ignorance that people have about black people. And they're also complicit in the current mental state of a lot of black men. So those were what I was citing as being direct Caucasian. Direct causation. I've got Caucasian on the brain. Yeah, causation. OK, so we could argue that had blacks people not been victims of enslavement, not been taken from their ancestral home, forced to work for little or no pay, they would have been viewed differently today and may even view themselves differently. The whole wrong, the wrongdoings mentioned 
continue to perpetrate and perpetuate harm because the mindset of the perpetrators has not changed. And the notion of white supremacy still exists in a lot of places and specific, you know, and particularly in places where there is power. And these are the people who make decisions, write legislations, and so these poor people don't stand a chance in hell. We could argue that black codes are still being enacted, black men are still being punished, black people are still victims of racial profiling and victimizations, blacks are still victims of police and violence, blacks are still disproportionately jailed, overrepresentation in the criminal justice system. Um, and how can damage caused by slavery be measured? You've got illegally deported, illegally deported and detained in immigration detention centers, robbed of their homes, jobs through wrongfully identifying wind Russians as illegal. Reparations are required to stop continuance of stigmatizing black men and to stop perpetuating a false and erroneous stereotype. That is why we need reparations to get rid of that false and negative and erroneous stereotype that black people are lazy, criminal, aggressive, and everything that's bad. So can slavery be financially quantified? May be difficult, but restitution is feasible via resources, fair treatment, options for paid re repatriation. These are my suggestions. Mass re-education and equal opportunities. How should compensation be divided out? These are my questions. By, you, by the UK when blacks all over the world are affected. We've got the black Africans, we've got the black Americans, we've got the black Caribbeans and we've got the black English. Okay, the argument for reparations is that we were targeted solely based on our identity and our race. We've been made to feel less than. Men are persistently and consistently criminalised, confined and imprisoned. There's a negative stereotype, is still being fed to society. Concessions occasionally made instead of acceptance that we are all equal, regardless of race, colour, gender, um, all of those protected characteristics. Um, Another argument is that we've been marginalised. We're targeted. There's, we are, you know, we're targeted in advertising, and we're, and we're also excluded in certain advertising. So, um, advertising is not straight across the board. Uh, board. We have faulty algorithms, biased face recognition software. So that's the argument I'm making. Well, probably other people are making it as well for reparations. And what am I suggesting that the reparation package should look like? Formal recognition, formal recognition that harm was inflicted on our ancestors that impacts the way people are treated and perceived today. So therefore an apology is required, but I know other people have asked for an apology. Restitution, reinstating our culture, identity, property, human rights, and the decriminalization of black men. And this can be achieved through re-education, revised educational packages and a new curriculum, building new cultural institutions and resources. I believe that they should be paid repatriation for those who want it uh, to turn to the motherland or the Caribbean. And I believe that they should be assigned a property over there um, that keeps them to the standard that they're used to. So I think that's really important that we have the option. I mean, they don't even have to worry about um, immigrants staying in this country because if they paid for our flight and set us up in the countries, you know, because we'd need kind of what you call them, um, reclimatization uh, programs because we don't know much about the countries. But I'm sure if they set up, you know, homes and stuff for people and so that they were back in the country where they were originally came from, even though they don't know it themselves and they had homes and they were, you know, they had some income, well, given a provisional allowance until they were able to defend for themselves, then, you know, I'm sure there'll be some people who'd want that option. Um, what else? I believe that they should offer dual nationality free of charge. Um, if the recipient doesn't want to use it, like, okay, they give you the English 
nationality plus um, the ancestral um, country, the, the nationality of the ancestral country. If the person doesn't come back between two or three years, the UK can revoke that dual nationality and that person would assume the nationality. I'm not quite sure how they would do that though. I don't know if that would work. I don't think you can just take on somebody, another country's nationality. So that might, might have to forget about the dual nationality, but they shouldn't be penalized if they're out of the country for over two years then. So they should have the option to return any time they like because they were the ones that took us out and brought them here. You know, if all goes well, we might not even want to come back. But the fact is, the option should be there. It, OK, at the moment, it's two years. I believe five years would be more than adequate if you, you, know, you extend that time of being out of the country. Um, I also suggest that they free men from prison on cannabis related offences, especially if it's less than an ounce. I believe that they should be free because it's not, you know, it's not like they're, it's not a harmful, it's not aggression, it's not violent offence. So I believe those men should be freed and I can imagine how many men would be freed on the street if they weren't imprisoned for petty offences. So that's another proper proposition for reparations. This is showing equality because we know that they're not legalising marijuana so they can criminalise black men. So that is why I'm making that as a part of the reparation package. Um, blacks also freed from detention centres with immediate effect if, they do, if the um, officials do not have evidence that they are illegal. We've got black people in detention centres and they're waiting to find out if they're illegal. And they're in there for months and they're waiting around, that should not happen. So all of those I'm suggesting in the reparation package that these people should be freed as well. Uh, if, we're, if, we're, if we're opting to stop treating black people as less than, and you know, anyway. Um, and if their, their benefits should be reinstated, all of those people who have been waiting for their visas to be approved should have benefits while they're waiting. That would bloody speed them up. If they knew that these people were getting benefits while they're waiting, while they're processing their applications, they'd soon speed up those applications, whether it's a yes or a no, but they would soon speed them up. So I would suggest also that people waiting for their applications for more than six months should start automatically receiving welfare, um, hospital access to health care and um, no no penalization for trying to get a property to rent um, and the accommodation should be subsidized um, I am also proposing a cultural educational facility for black Brits who need to be acclimatized to their new home because even though as we see a lot of black Brits are going to Africa I don't know how they, whether they had friends over there, but it'd still be nice to know that there's a, some kind of institution that you can go there and learn about the culture because cultures are so different. And like I said, you can offend people without realizing it. And it's good to know how to behave and what is acceptable from what not, what is not. I mean, yes, you can get it on Google, but it would be nice to actually be taught by the locals. Um, so that is what I'm also proposing. Um, educational centres that teach five different learning styles. At the moment, we have everybody bunged into the same educational facility and we have different learning styles. Some people don't read. Some people prefer to see the visual to learn. Some people um, learn by hearing. Some people learn by reading. But you have different learning styles. But what they do, especially in school, is that everybody's expected to learn in the same way. And they do know that there are different learning styles. So they're therefore some people are disadvantaged if they are more akin to one learning style than another. Um, reasserting that people's status in society so everyone is equal. Um, slavery still exists in all its various forms. Um, 
I don't know if black slavers are as cruel as those white slave masters used to be, but we've got slavery in Sudan, black Sudanese enslaved by Arabs from the Bagara ethnic group. We have um, slaves in Libya, black Africans from neighboring countries seeking to cross over to Europe via the Libyan coast are getting captured by Libyan rebels and sold off to local slave masters. We've got slaves in Egypt, in, for, in the Sinai Peninsula, mostly human trafficking. We've got um, 250,000 modern slaves in South Africa, um, according to the Global Slavery Index. Um, Nigeria, Pakistan, China, India and North Korea are the top five nations with the largest number of victims that account for 60% of the world's victims of modern day slavery. Ghana has 1.1 million adults in forced labour, especially in the coca growing countries, co coca growing areas in the country. Eritrea has high rates of modern slavery, North Korea um, forced to work by the state, unpaid labour, farming, construction and road building. India, 8 million victims out of a population of 1.3 billion. So there are a few more, but you know, I put those down because sometimes we think slavery is dead. It's not completely dead, but the, um, but their enslavement does not play out in the same way it, it is when it's not based on a white supremacist mindset. That is the difference. Um, what else is there? Um, so the role of private organisations and individuals complicit in the slave trade do not have to be scoped. They just need to acknowledge and put right the wrongs. Um, E.g. the lies about our history, as I said before, I'm just recapping now. And our role in the world, reinstating our credibility by re-educating and a new year round black history curriculum that is based on truth and delivered by experts to request the return of all our valuable resources which have been transferred from person to person might be unrealistic but the equivalent amount in compensation so that systems are in place to improve disadvantaged black people's quality of life is feasible. Um, take police brutality and racial profiling more seriously. Um, offer post-traumatic stress and other forms of counselling for the resultant breakups of homes, absent fathers, domestic violence, drug-infused homes, etc. Loss through detention of fathers, killing of our young men, loss of culture, identity and name, pain, physical and emotional. Because what they don't seem to realise, the people are talking about, oh, it happened all those years ago, is that the impact that slavery had on the mindset of people and subsequent generations because if one mindset has if one mindset believes that they're less than and they believe that they're inferior then they feed that down to their children and they feed that down to their children and I remember my mum used to say to me oh we're going to get out oh so and so is coming around one of our white neighbours we've got to get out the best china and my mum is more recent and she still had that mindset. So it's only, you know, as you know, as we're getting closer, you know, to now, more current, that people are actually realizing, oh, wait a minute, you know, why don't I get nice china? Why why isn't the china taken out when I come to the house or when other black people come to the house? So that mindset, that colonial mindset exists up till very, very recently. And that is why it's important for reparations to be done because the damage is long lasting and it will continue until people are re-educated about what happened in our history. White people don't know. A lot of black people don't know. They still feel as though black pe white people still feel as though their black people are inferior and some black people still believe that they're inferior. And that is the damage that slavery all those years ago has done. So it's not remote and it's not distant at all. Um, and of course, there's the pain, physical and emotional. There is the suggestion that human actions of the slave trade caused remote and distant effects. But the effects, like I said, are very close and very real. 
So while the perpetrators may not be able to erase all the consequences produced by their actions, they can reverse laws and legislation so that it doesn't disadvantage black people. They need an unbiased legal team to go through immigration policies, police legislation, to ensure that it's fair and just. Police should be properly accountable for cruelty and use of excessive force. And the Home Office should redress the way they are handling visa applications for foreign nationals. And that would be a start. And that's all for now. Bye-bye.